Thank you so much to our presenters. Um, thank you for that enlightening presentation. Again, I, I see that um, there are some questions coming up in the chat box. Um, most of the questions were about the rapid test kits and its availability, but I realized that Lomoti has already answered that it's only supplied by Noguchi Memorial Institute to hospitals, the government hospital and not for sale. So private hospitals may contact the Gucci for more information. Um, we have two more presentations to go, but I think we can take a few questions at this point. If there are any questions, you can raise your hand and then you'll be allowed to unmute and ask your question. Okay, um, Dr. Gladys Momote, I see your hand up. Please um, go ahead. Sorry, it's not a question, it's just to answer. Somebody was asking where they could get the gu guidelines for Ghana. Um, you can get them on the Ministry of Health website. When you go there, you go to publications, and then you have all the publications that have been released there that you can download as well. I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. So if there are no more questions, then we'll take our next presentation. The next presentation would be by Dr. Jonah Deby up here again. He's going to talk to us about oxygen therapy in management of COVID. So Dr. Deby up here, if you're ready, please go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, actually, Sandra is taking this one and I'll do the next one. So if Sandra is ready, she can share her slides. Hi. Yeah. Hi, good evening. Um, please hear presentation next uh, tomorrow. So we can go on to the next presenter. Okay, so she is doing her presentation tomorrow. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, uh, thank you very much. Then let me quickly um, put mine out. So this presentation will be about management of patients in the ICU. And Dr. Davy Apia will be doing it with um, Ikea Jumo Prempe. Ikea Jumo Prempe is um, a nurse practitioner. She is a critical care nurse and also has a, um, a master's in advanced practice nurse in pediatrics. So she will join Dr. Davy to do this presentation. Please go ahead, Dr. Davy. Thank you very much. Um, again, once again, Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, which all protocols observed, um, this presence, uh, uh, the, the talk is on management of patients with severe and critical illness, a bit focused on critical illness. Fortunately, the two previous speakers also touched a little bit on part of what I am going to say. I will leave out a lot of the fine details because the fine details probably will not benefit most of the people here because most, uh, um, will, but um, at least to have an idea and those who also manage cases so in ICU. So a quick introduction. Um, I would like to go through, this has been done, I don't want to bore you, but a quick one is the fact that patients with these features in terms of neurological, acute neurological derangement, so altered level of consciousness less than um, um, nine, definitely we need to come to the ICU. Respiratory system, any patient with severe respiratory distress, poor saturation, and also irritability. There's a combination describing respiratory failure. So for such a patient with COVID, you need to um, discuss with ICU. Recurrent apnea, uh, irregular breathing. These are indications for patients to be sent to ICU. We know most of our patients, most almost 70% uh, of patients with COVID actually present respiratory uh, system dysfunction, but a little over that, a little uh, above, um, I mean, 30% of them will present with other features like sepsis, septic shock. 
and then also thromboembolic uh, uh, phenomenon and uh, with mist in some situations. So these are cases uh, that must also be managed in an ICU or managed with a critical care uh, um, in mind. So um, these are the indications for that. The question next is the decision to admit. This is very important. We have limited ICU resources. So in terms of uh, deciding who to admit, we need to take a lot of things into consideration. Having said that the clinical presentation, as I alluded to earlier on, let me add that one of the key things is, uh, what do you call it, um, 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 health workers um, gut feeling. Okay, gut feeling actually is an indication that, uh, or indication to consider as part of the clinical decision making. So any health worker with, uh, especially our senior nurses, if they come to you and tell you that, doctor, this particular patient, I'm not comfortable with this particular patient here, do not disregard that gut feeling because uh, it's, it's actually been proven to be quite uh, valuable. And then what I, I call values and preferences. Um, ICU is a, a resource intensive area. You see very few patients, but it, it's resource intensive in, ter in terms of uh, finances, in terms of uh, utilization of hospital uh, resources, manpower, uh, uh, human resource, uh, and other uh, intangible, tangible and intangible resources. These are very uh, um, important considerations that you have to make. When it comes to values, you have to listen to the patient's values. You just don't bundle any patient at all or every patient to IC without communicating that to the patient. It's very critical that they understand what is going to be done to them. You listen to their concerns. You try as much as possible. And from my experience across board, all patients, if you take time, family members, if you take time to explain what you are going to do, what your goal is for the child, what the goal is for the family, uh, most of them will actually understand what is going on. It's better to have a patient who understands what you are doing in your ICU or your critical care unit than to just bundle without providing much information. Oh, your patient is being, your child is being sent to the ICU with minimal information. So that's very important. We also look at patient uh, preferences, uh, uh, family preferences. Here also it's quite important in terms of uh, preferences. Some might outright say that for this reason and this reason and this reason, I don't want to go there. Remember affordability, uh, feasibility, and all these preferences are things that you need to take into consideration. If you're a policymaker, these are also very important that you, you factor all this into that. You don't want a situation where a patient will be sent to um, an ICU, and you agree with me that um, I see, as I said, require resources. So you don't want a situation where a patient is, will be, is sent to an ICU and they are not able to afford medications like sedation, sedatives that they need to be sedated if you have to intubate and ventilate them. I am saying this because, I mean, uh, um, without appropriate safety measures in ICU, these are safety issues. It's, it doesn't bother on direct treatment, but safety issues in ICU, without that, uh, patient's outcomes are poor. Because if you intubate a patient without sedating, if you intubate a patient without pro providing adequate pain medication, their outcomes are poorer than those who are, who, who are actually, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, taking, um, who are given uh, adequate sedation and then also pain control. And then medical ethics. So um, here we talk about pandemic ethics. And in pandemic, just as we, we, we have, you've heard about flattening the care, flattening the care, flattening the care, because resources is not available. It boils down to resources availability at the national level, at the facility level. So at the facility level, what sort of resources are available? And you have to decide based on taking moral decisions. These are not wrong or uh, what do you call it, right decision, but there are decisions that you need to take time to go through and discuss. Sometimes you have to convene, discuss it with other senior colleagues, members to come in to help you arrive at a, a, a preferred decision. 
Once a patient, that decision is made, admission decision is made, and the patient is admitted to the ICU, the treatment for COVID, I mean, uh, uh, mostly is support, supportive care, supportive therapy. As at now, in terms of the, um, aside supportive therapeutics, the only proven medication, let me state again, the only proven medication that actually uh, uh, helps patients or improves outcome in terms of outcome, in terms of uh, survival, mortality, is corticosteroids. Um, uh, we don't have any other medication with, with, um, um, with any proven track record currently. This opens the door wide for more research, more data, more publication to be made. So please let's let's understand let's understand this, and then uh, uh, also go about it. Oxygen therapy. Sandra is going to talk about oxygen therapy later tomorrow, so I'm going to speak, skip that. But oxygen is the main state of treatment. Across board, all patients who have severe disease, oxygen is the treatment that all of them will need to receive. So um, uh, please have that at the back of your mind. Circulatory system, fluid and electrolyte management, renal uh, supportive therapy. These are therapies that uh, we need to talk about. And then again, corticosteroids. So oxygen and corticosteroids, the examethasone, hydrocortisone, prednisolone, or methylprednisolone. These are the proven, these have proven benefit in terms of mortality outcome. All right, so uh, that is incontrovertible. We have the evidence uh, in literature to back that. I, I will say that if there is no evidence to back that, we don't we haven't published evidence to show, uh, and, uh, and we we hang on to things that so far have been proven to be effective. We need to be careful because they are they are benefit. The way risk and benefit, the risk or the adverse events sometimes outweigh the, the benefits that they, they actually de, de, uh, derive. We de, they derive from the treatment. So um, oxygen therapy, the oxygen uh, uh, options in terms of therapeutic support is uh, using nasal prong or non-invasive uh, methods, which add, add, in addition to the oxygen, CPAP, which add a bit of pressure to the airway to open up the uh, alveolar, improve the ventilation. And then high flow nasal oxygen therapy. High flow nasal oxygen therapy um, is, is, is a special machine that is used to deliver oxygen at a very high uh, uh, flow rate, more than what can be delivered by uh, our um, regular flow meters that we have available. We have the non invasive ventilation. Again, uh, those are the ones I just listed about. But the next important thing is to monitor the patients in terms of vital signs and uh, oxygen saturation once initiate, you initiate therapy. So each step of the way for respiratory support, what you need to do is to monitor the vital signs. As part of the <clears throat> vital signs, I recommend that you do regular or every two hours minimum in an ICU. You should be able to do the GCS and compare with the previous GCS whether they are normal or deteriorating or the patient is improving. That is when uh, that is what must be done. I see it's not only about putting uh, putting the patient on high uh, tech equipment, but also the basic getting the basic doing the basic things right. So uh, measuring, checking the SpO2, ensuring that SpO2 is improving. You've heard about patients who do not respond to oxygen therapy. Uh, there are two uh, do two types. If it's non-invasive, two types of patients who do not respond to oxygen therapy. There are two types of patients with a respiratory uh, ARDS type, which uh, uh, typical ARDS, those patients should respond when you put them on oxygen and ventilate them with the oxygen. But there are patients who do not respond even if you initiate ventilation. And with that, you need to start thinking about patients who have thromboembolic phenomena. So these are the patients who benefit from um, 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 thromboembolic uh, therapy. So um, it's not across board. Critically ill patients, actually, the data shows that those who are critically ill in ICUs and severely ill, if you initiate thromboembolic therapy at this point in time, 
they turn out to do poor than those who have see, who have who are not critically ill. So critically ill, you have to be very selective in which uh, in those, which patients receive thromboembolic therapy. Indications for mechanical ventilation. So when a patient you initiate your oxygen therapy, which you will be uh, Sandra will discuss uh, tomorrow. If you initiate that and then the patient is not responding, then you are looking at hypoxemic or refractory uh, to oxygen therapy. As I mentioned, there are two types of patients who will not respond to the nasal prong or high flow or CPAP. We have those who uh, are referred to as the happy hypoxic patients. Those patients usually tend to have uh, other more of perfusion problem to the lung than uh, uh, primary lung disease. And uh, so we need to be careful how you ventilate such patients uh, in terms of uh, tidal volumes and uh, other things that you, markers that you use, uh, vo volumes and pressures. The next one, next patient in shock with other organ failure. So if a patient is in shock with other organ failure, looking at other organ failure, I'm thinking about the uh, uh, CNS, altered level of consciousness, patients with uh, respiratory dysfunction, patients with renal dysfunction. These are patients who, who need to go on uh, a mechanical ventilator because they have more than one organ system. A shock is established when you've given uh, 20 mil per kg fluid bolus and still the patient's uh, signs like capillary refill time, fast heart rate, and uh, also, uh, if you have blood pressure, DP apparatus, you check the blood pressure. But hypotension is a late sign. So you don't want to use that weight for patients' BP to drop in pediatric population. It's not a good sign. It's a late sign. If you pick weight or you see hypotension in such patients, you'll be running, uh, you, you, you'll be in shock. Um, you'll be in shock yourself. Let me put it that way. Uh, again, acute le altered level of consciousness, patients who cannot protect their airway with GCS less than eight. Such patients are not able to protect their airway. So the tendency that they will lie down aspirate, whether gross as, uh, vomiting and aspiration or silent aspiration, the risk is very high in this patient population. So if you have a COVID patient with such altered level of consciousness and they cannot protect their airway, you need to intubate and ventilate them. Um, so um, those are the indications for um, admitting, the clinical indications for admitting. But as I've said, uh, uh, in terms of mechanical ventilation, this is an invasive procedure. You don't have to do it lightly. The machine can kill just like any other drug and any other intervention that we give in hospital. Even IV fluids we give, you know we can, IV fluids can kill patients, fluid overload can kill patients. We have seen such cases. I'm, I'm sure most of you have come across such situations before. So the same way applies to mechanical vent, uh, ventilation. So please do not take it lightly when you are putting a patient on a mechanical ventilation. This requires skill and knowledge, especially with a pediatric population, because uh, this is a special population. They have fragile uh, uh, anatomy. They have uh, different anatomy from adults and um, they, they need to be taken care of with special attention. When you are ventilating, we refer to a lung protective strategy. Lung protective strategy is especially in ARDS, but across board for all patients. There are patients that you might, you have to intubate because their lung has pathology. There are patients that you intubate not because their lung is pathological, but other areas, like I mentioned, GCS is that low and you want to protect their airway. So, um, so in that case, in, in that case, in, in, in that case, you need to be sure what you are dealing. If you take a patient who has a, a respiratory lung disease and you want to ventilate, there are those with obstructive disease and there are those with restrictive disease. The restrictive disease is typical ARDS and then the pneumonias, but there are obstructive disease patients come in and they, they present with wheezes air trapping syndrome. So asthma-like presentation, as we see in some COVID cases. These, in terms of ventilation, you ventilate with different strategies. 
you don't go in and then just because the ventilator is there, you have an idea to put a patient on. Be careful what you do. And basically, the lung protective strategy include, uh, involves administering tidal volume between 4 to 7.5 mils per kg. The ideal uh, volume is about 6.5, 6.2 mil per kg body weight of tidal volume. There are two options of doing this uh, for those listening, those who, who are ventilating. You might use uh, uh, pressure control or volume control, sorry. And then a third one, which is pressure regulated volume control ventilation. Um, whichever one you pick, I, I think is up to the, 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 the uh, clinician who is managing the patient. But if you are doing pressure control, you need to monitor the patient's tidal volume so that you don't damage the lung. If the patient has, if the patient has problems with, uh, patient is on a ventilator and has problems oxygenation, you have to set <coughs> your saturation target and then pH target a bit lower than normal. So you allow the patient to be acidotic. You allow the patient to retain some CO2 in an attempt to save the lung. Because if you overdo it, that can also worsen, cause major systemic sepsis-like disease if you are ventilating a patient and you are not doing right, it right. So these are what we refer to the, if you allow CO2 to rise above the normal range, slightly above the normal range, referred to as a, a permissive hypo, uh, hypercapnia. And then we have permissive hypoxia. So in this situation, you, you accept saturation around 85% if the patient's lung is strag uh, struggling to deliver uh, what you call it saturation. So all about oxygen delivery to the tissue. You don't only think about improving oxygenation without improving circulation. So this heart lung interaction combination is actually what will lead you to deliver adequate oxygen to the tissue. If this is even done very well, you can even do this without intubating the, uh, a number of our patients. So depending on how the approach you take, those who might choose to go for high flow nasal cannula, actually this, sorry, uh, nasal oxygen therapy. This, this is a, a very good, um, what do you call it? Means of CPAP and uh, high flow nasal oxygen therapy. A very uh, uh, nice way of avoiding intubating patient with its attending uh, infection uh, problems. And uh, <clears throat> I'm sure you remember uh, foreign bodies in, in infections in foreign bodies in children uh, uh, or in the sick population. If you intubate a patient or if you keep a patient, intubate a patient, you put in a, a foreign body, like a, div a foreign device, each tube is a foreign device. Uh, bladder catheter, Foley's catheter, it's a, uh, it's a foreign device. Central line is a foreign device. These are prone to developing biofilms which serves to protect invading microorganisms and give them a sanctuary place where they can hang on and then share um, from time to time. So you have your patient developing hospital acquired infection in that situation to prevent that uh, uh, you need to set in and then look for uh, infection prevention bundles. So these are bundles that is used. So we have the central line associated uh, infection bundle. We have uh, ventilator associated uh, pneumonia bundles. We have uh, um, uh, urethral catheter associated bundles that you need to be aware of. So implement that in your ICU when you are me mechanically ventilating patients or you have patients in your ICU. So these are safety measures that we have to be aware of. Treatment of shock. Um, here, I'll recommend that instead of using starting with 20 mil per kg, you can start with 10 mils per kg. Bolusus reassess the patient. If the patient needs further treat uh, uh, boluses, you can give up to about 40 to 60 mil per kg. Anything beyond 60 mil per kg, you have to look and discuss uh, this with uh, an intensivist. Uh, uh, again, you have to watch out for fluid overload, which is very important. To add antibiotics, yes, actually in ICU, uh, uh, we will talk about adding antibiotics because usually they've been sick for more than seven days. And we know that a proportion, significant proportion of such patients have secondary bacterial infection. So um, I recommend that you can start that as broad spectrum. 
but your broad spectrum shouldn't go more than 48 hours without you taking black culture to follow up. Uh, we need to be very good towards of our little antibiotics left. So let's be uh, careful how we throw around our antibiotics. COVID is a viral infection. The first few days, no antibacterial medication has proven effective on record. No antibacterial medication has proven effective. So we have to be careful how we dispense our antibiotics during uh, the period of infection, this COVID infection. Once you confirm for COVID and it's a first week viral mild infection, please stay away from antibiotics. It is not going to affect the cause of the infection. All right, so um, that is that is the uh, recommendation there. Again, once you take blood culture within 72 hours, decide in terms of rational use of antibiotics and then also uh, antibiotic stewards, whether you are going to change, you are going to uh, alter your uh, treatment to narrow spectrum instead of initial broad spectrum, because the patient also requires some bacterial uh, presence to protect himself. Do not eliminate all the good bacteria. There are some very, very, very good bacteria protecting the patient. If you wipe them out with our broad spectrum antibiotics that we give for more than uh, three days, we eventually open them up for all sorts of infections. So please have that at the back of your mind. Again, systemic corticosteroids have been given and systemic corticosteroids uh, at 0.2 dexamethasone is what has been evaluated. Hydrocortisone has been evaluated, methylprednisolone, prednisolone has been evaluated. So all this, these have proven that it can cut uh, mortality down by up to about 30%. In some cases, they're severely ill and then the critically ill. Those who are critically ill have more benefit when you use uh, corticosteroids on them. So, but those without critical illness do, do not benefit, without severe illness do not benefit. Actually, their prognosis are worse than those uh, who are not given. So if it's mild, please stay away from corticosteroids. It's important that you, you regulate the patient's blood sugar. Ideally, it should be a little bit permissive. Allow the blood sugar to rise up to about 10 millimoles if, the, if it's naturally rising. But if it's beyond uh, 10 millimoles per liter for more than 24 hours, and it's not iatrogenic, we tend to create the atrogenic uh, hypo, hyperglycemia. So please be sure that it's not iatrogenic before you start treating that. Otherwise you tip your patient into hypoglycemia. All right, so in terms of fluid management, aside resuscitation with uh, uh, um, uh, fluid, um, and then the resuscitation fluid, the choice should be uh, uh, plasma friendly. Okay, normal saline is not plasma friendly. Ringus lactate and other plasma light B, if you have that, that is what is recommended. Please do not use ringus. If you have ringus lactate, don't go in for normal saline in resuscitation. All right. The same way if you are giving maintenance fluid. For ICU patients, because they have their um, um, fluid metabolism is altered, you need to be careful how much fluid you put in. There are several reasons for that, why we give between 70 to 80% of the daily maintenance. Uh, and uh, as a result of the fact that the patient himself tried to regulate secreting ADHA uh, in some way, there are some inappropriate ones, but these also uh, regulate in the acutely ill, severely ill patient, they regulate their own uh, fluid bolus in fluids, uh, sorry, men, uh, in, in some way. So let us not force our thinking on the body. Let's try and follow what the body wants to do. Feeding, we recommend that feeding starts early. Feeding is also protective, can protect the patient's gut against infection. So early feeding, if there is no mechanical obstruction or no uh, absolute indication for uh, fe uh, not feeding the patient, please, you can start feeding early. Once you stabilize your patient in our ICU, within six hours, we have started uh, um, feeding patients who are intubated and uh, um, on mechanical ventilators. Um, we know uh, published data shows that their outcomes are better. We need to monitor and uh, respond again to uh, what we are doing. When you intubate a patient, you need to monitor them, make sure that they stay within uh, what you want, where you want them to be. And then we need to bring in patient comfort, comfort care or palliative care. What I propose is that any patient entering an ICU must be given seen as patient requiring comfort care. 
And I'm sure Ekwia Juma will talk a little bit more about the comfort care, making patients comfortable in terms of controlling pain, in terms of symptomatic treatment. These are very important. And then palliative care, end of life issues. Ideally, you don't want to admit a patient who is going to go into, uh, uh, who you think is going to die. I see, you know, it's not a place you admit patients who are going to die. That's part of the admission decisions you have that would have taken earlier, whether medical ethics, whether the patient is going to benefit from ICU. Most critically ill patients need ICU care, but the question is, are they going to benefit from the ICU care, the resources that they need to use? That decision must be taken by the admitting clinicians. There are therapies that initially, uh, repurposed drugs that initially we, we were talking about when we thought we had hope, but currently there is clearly no evidence for uh, currently for this. Ivermectin, for instance, uh, make, uh, the company manufacturing it came out to say this, we, we don't have any evidence for that. As it reminds me, the cost has shot up. And I'm sure if we continue to use azithromycin the way we use azithromycin now, we might lose the effectiveness of azithromycin. But uh, probably the only place that we, 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 might, uh, we might fall on will be the um, um, patients with inflammatory diseases. So please, let's be careful what we, 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 we advocate for. And I don't think hydroxychloroquine has any, uh, has any benefit in the IC, especially with situations where you have circulatory and respiratory problems and challenges. So I would ask that in the IC, you stay away from this med improving medication. My, uh, uh, I end here. Thank you very much for the attention. And then I'll leave the um, um, stage for Equia Dumont to um, present her. I think Akia will share her uh, slides and then present. Thank you very much. Okay, good evening, everybody. As already stated, I'm presenting for the management of the critically ill child for COVID-19. So for my presentation outline, I'll give the introduction. I'll talk about my regular aid framework, which comprises of my mother to child interaction, pain and comfort, hydration, regulation, nutrition, microbial load, skin and mucosal integrity, and the developmentally supportive care. So the introduction, uh, my Police and my bosses have already talked about COVID-19. So in nursing the critically ill COVID-19 children, evidence have proven that supporting optimal autonomic regulation is key. And then for the nursing aspect, this supportive care has been summarized in eight key domains, which we call the real goal eight. The first of this framework is mother to child interaction. Even in the context of social distancing, the importance of mothers as partners in care remain a key point of family-centered pediatric intensive care. Therefore, we cannot take the mother or the caregiver out of the care for the COVID-19 child. So in order to get mother very interactive, we assess mother's knowledge on COVID-19. In order to build on it, we clear all myths, we allow room for questions and reassure the mother. We provide psychological care. We give clear guides of how the PPEs are used and why we are in the PPE. And we teach and encourage mother to engage with child. In cases that physical family presence won't be possible, it's the duty of us, the clinical team, to find other alternatives to involve the mother in care. Such alternatives can be, the, can be virtual. We can make virtual calls for mother to see the child. We, 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 in order to make this virtual call very successful, we need to know the relationship between mother and other cats in the house so that we will know how 
to involve those case too. In other not to separate their sick sibling from them. And then we, um, our second is the pain and comfort, which is very important. As my boss, Dr. Davy, said, every patient entering the ICU should be given a form of palliative care. And then in order to provide this comfort to the patient, we encourage caregivers' presence also as a, as a way of comforting the child. Because seeing the nurses and PPE for a child who, for a, 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 a healthy child who suddenly is sick, being separated from his or her normal environment and being introduced to a new environment with all this PPE, we need to encourage the caregivers to be part so that we can help in allaying anxiety for the child. Position comes also in the pain and comfort. And then we assess pain using the age appropriate tool. We give adequate sedation in cases where patient has been intubated. For the child in ICU, we assume that he or she has been intubated. So we make sure that we are sedating the patient adequately. We cluster our cares. We provide a safe and calm environment and we assess pain after all the pain interventions. We give prescribed antibiotics and we also give prescribed anxiolytics to release anxiety. And then in cases where we are managing children in the HDU, we look for other methods to distract pain. I go to my third which is the hydration. So for hydration, we want to maintain optimal fluid balance. So we strictly monitor our intake and output. We assess hydration status too early and manage the child accordingly. We observe for signs of fluid overload and dehydration. We check for our urine specific gravity in other to achieve our goal of maintaining optimal fluid balance. Then we come to our regulation, which is very, very important in nursing the critically ill child with COVID-19. Our vital signs, we, we want to check our vital signs early. That is our temperature. We maintain the normal regulation, our heart rate, our BP, both invasive and non-invasive. And then we check our circulatory status, also one hourly. We give our prescribed pyretics, antipyretics in cases that we have in a high temperature. And then another important point under this regulation is to check the level of consciousness for our patients. And then we want to check this one hourly and compare it with the baseline consciousness that the child was admitted with in order to help us to know whether we are winning or losing, whether the conscious level is improving or is decreasing. And then we monitor for signs of seizures. And then we also want to put the child on the ECG monitoring. We monitor our electrolytes and our ABGs to guide us in our ventilator settings. Then we want to maintain a normal glycemic range. We want to put our patient in the prone position to help with the respiratory distress. And then we want to monitor our respiratory rate, our saturations every hour and observe for signs of worsening respiratory distress and manage accordingly. Then we give the appropriate oxygen therapy and titrate per patient condition. And then in cases where the patient is in the HDU, we secure airway if unconscious. That's the intubate patient. Our next point of our regular age is our nutrition. We want to initiate feeding as soon as possible. We, we need to assess our ability for the, uh, the patient's ability to swallow. We assess the nutritional status of the patient and involve the dietitian in dietary planning. We want to pass NG2 for feeding and observe the progress of feeding. 
and then we want to monitor our glucose levels in order to maintain a normal glycemic state. We monitor for our signs of constipation and diarrhea and manage accordingly. We monitor the growth and then we want to give multivitamins to help with the nutritional status. Then we come to the microbial load, which is also very, very significant with our patients in the ICU. Here we want to maintain and observe very strict IPC measures, both for everybody involved in this care, not for nurses only, not for doctors only, for, but for everybody involved in the care of the patient. We want to maintain and observe the strict IPC measures. And then we want to use appropriate PPE. As we are doing procedures that is aerosol, that generate aerosol. We don't expect to be using surgical masks for such patients, but rather our N95. And then for our intubated patients, we need to keep our VAP bundles, which involve our oral care, position of our patient, position of ventilator tubings, and how we suction the patient. For our patients with central line, we need to observe our central line care bundles. We need to disconnect and use IV lines. We also need to um, observe our catheter care bundles, follow up on our blood and urine cultures, plus our sputum cultures, and then we can give antibiotics appropriately. And by giving antibiotics, we want to maintain and observe our antibiotic stewardship. Then we give our prescribed probiotics. For our next point, we talk about the skin and mucosa integrity. We don't want any of our children in the ICU to develop dead sores. So regular turning in bed is one of the most important things we do for children in the ICU. Ideally, we want to do it four hourly. But if there is any other thing pre preventing us from doing it for early, then we can resort to fix early. We care for our pressure source as we are turning patients. And then we care for the skin around all invasive tubes in order to keep the mucosa integrity very intact. Then we apply our barrier creams for our small children and our babies. We need to perform very proper nappy care and change because we don't want to add nappy rashes to our already immunocompromised patients. Then our total personal hygiene also comes under this segment, plus our Nistacin cream for our oral care. Then we go also with our six hourly mask care alternating toothpaste with fluorhexidine. Our last and next point is supporting this child developmentally. As I said initially about involving mothers in the care, we should take history from mother to know the developmental milestone that the child has already attained before getting sick because we are presuming that um, post-ICU debit or long COVID syndrome can make the child retrogress. So we need to take this history and then we know how to plan after the child has recovered or after the child has been discharged. So we educate this caregiver about possible retrogression in a simple, clear language that she would understand in order to allay her anxiety, because we would need her in the aftercare. And then as part of this also, we need to perform range of motion exercise whilst the child is on admission. Teach mother and then, teach mother and then we, we, we observe her while she do it. We need to employ our play therapies that is after the child has been off the ventilator. And then we need to also um, talk about existing comorbidities. 
if the child had, if they didn't have, then we need to assess by readiness for school. That is for the school age children. Then we need to also talk and then manage how, talk and then discuss how we are going to manage the long COVID syndrome. And then we need to encourage mother to get support either from friends, from other family members, from other um, mothers who are also having children being in the ICU. So as to get them in the care, help them understand, and then to aid in the recovery of the child. Then we need to involve the physiotherapist and the occupational therapist all to support this child developmentally. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Eklia Jumopempe. Thank you for taking us through what comprehensive nursing care for a child in the ICU would look like. Um, that would be our last presentation for today. If you have any more questions, kindly raise your hand so that you can be asked to unmute your mic and then go ahead and ask your questions. Otherwise, you can also put your questions in the chat box, as mentioned earlier on. Um, we have to say a very big thank you to our presenters for today. It's been a very wonderful session. Um, Mr. Chairman, please take over from, from, from now. Okay, thank you very much. Now I'm able to do that. So um, thank you so much, all the presenters. I think um, it's been a very very educative session and i can hear a baby crying so it just says that we are doing pediatric uh, covid so yeah so thank you so much every um yes um dr Deby was mentioning um information data gathering has been one of our major challenges even when it comes to national case management uh, a lot of effort has gone in to try and get data across the country it's been very challenging uh, we've been able to secure laptops for all the treatment centers and then to even get the data is a major challenge. But I know that when it comes to the schools, when the schools reopen, the number of children who have gotten COVID, among other things, this data is available. And then we should be able to get that for you um, very easily from the surveillance team. I mean, they have actually cataloged and which schools, which regions, and the mobilities and things, we can get that for you from that place. A uh, delay in the results um, was a major challenge right from the beginning. There were delays 10 days, two weeks. People even recovered before we get their results. Uh, we had only the Gucci KCCR in Kumasi. But I mean, as of now, we have about 11 centers across the country that you can do PCR. Uh, some of the gene expert machines for TB were recalibrated to do uh, tests for COVID. So that has also improved. The RDT, yes, we have been following RDT for so long. The challenge was that uh, a lot of the RDTs that came didn't pass the FDA requirements. But the biosensor that um, Dr. Lomote mentioned, yes, that um, shows quite a high sensitivity and virtually 100% sensitivity. Uh, sorry, sensitivity was about 80 and specificity was about 100%. And Professor Ampofo has gotten some quantity that he released for us to do trials just to be sure how effective they are. Just last week, um, there was a meeting with the Minister of Health to see how we can roll the RDTs across the country because uh, as Dr. Adebi said, this is going to help us to sort out the cases at the emergency room among other places. And if you remember, early on in the pandemic, we had major challenge with suspected cases. You know, we had suspected cases in the ER, we'll be there for days waiting for results, consuming all our PPEs, among other things. So now we have very effective our uh, Actually, um, we're giving to some of the centers just to enable us to quickly sort out. So it's not being, it's not like Noguchi is distributing that. Very soon, it will roll about the Ghana Health and Minister of Health. So what we have is just some quantity that we're giving to some of the treatment centers uh, to start using and see how effective they are. So the plan is to do the RDT and do a PCR to confirm. 
Um, Dr. Amwa, who happens to be one of our case management uh, team members, has been very, very helpful when it comes to management of pediatric cases, as well as UGMC, very, very instrumental in training. They went through the classification and the management, among other things. Um, of course, um, oxygen therapy is key. And, but when it comes to ICU care, that is where we fall short. As a country, we don't have that big capacity for ICU care. And then, of course, if for adults we don't have, then when it comes to the pediatrics, uh, then it becomes even more challenging. We don't have the intensivists. We don't have very few critical care nurses. We don't have enough ICU capacity. So quite a number of the mortalities that were recorded across the country was basically because we didn't have capacity to manage severe and critical. Um, if you remember the second wave, I mean, there were times we had severe and critical who needed care that we didn't have. But um, uh, we are building capacity. A lot of training is going on. And I just listening to all the presentations, I mean, you just get the sense of the wealth of knowledge, the expertise that are available. And uh, it is very important that um, the ministry makes these logistics and facilities available because there are people capable of managing this patient. It's just that the facilities are not there. Um, they talked about post-COVID. Post-COVID is becoming very critical now. We have people who are supposed to have been discharged from the COVID care pathway, and they are having complications. So case management team has set up, um, has encouraged various regions and treatment centers to set up post-COVID uh, care centers. And then it's very important that um, even with the pediatric population, we have these patients are followed up because um, we know that they have long-term uh, mobilities and that can be very challenging. I mean, I see UK, we need expertise. Um, very few intensivists and we need to build capacity there. Uh, we saw the nursing care and the challenge with the pediatrics is that, you know, uh, managing these people, it's a living their mild. Dr. Amwa mentioned that um, even if they are home, you know, how do you control the child who is positive? How do you control the movement? The whole family is there. If the child is here, the mother is there. So it becomes even more difficult. And we appreciate all the work the pediatrician are doing in the care of uh, patients or children with COVID. Um, the challenges are there, but I think we are making a lot of progress. And so uh, I want to thank everybody. And I'll convey the message, all the work that the Pediatric Society is doing to the uh, National Case Management Team, to the Presidential Advisor and all his team to know what is going on and for them to also ensure that the necessary support and logistics that they can make available uh, to the pediatric society and for that matter, the pediatricians to also help manage children with COVID to reduce morbidity and mortality. Uh, it's been very exciting. I have learned a lot and I know most people have learned a lot. Um, the second session is tomorrow. So I looked at the number of participants and it's amazing. I know people have learned a lot and tomorrow is going to be even much, much better. So please, let's have a good rest this evening. Tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. sharp, let's join and listen to more. There's more information coming that is going to help all of us to be able to manage children with COVID. So thank you, and I thank you for inviting me. Have a blessed evening. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And a very big thank you to everybody for joining. I know that we've all learned so much already. Um, so um, we'll take our closing prayer and then tomorrow's presentation starts at 9 a.m., um, not 4 p.m. Um, like today. So let's keep note of that. And it promises to be exciting. We'll talk about the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. We'll talk about indications for anticoagulation. We'll talk about infection prevention and control in pediatrics and management of the newborn with COVID. We talk about public health issues such as school reopening and then next steps. So join us for another exciting session tomorrow. Thank you all so much for your attention. And um, we do have um, evaluation forms um, that have been shared. The link for the evaluation form has been shared in the chat box. So kindly fill out the form so that we know how um, it went today, and then we can use that to improve on um, tomorrow's presentation as well. Thank you for joining. And um, the session was recorded, so as the link is made, uh, uh, when the link is ready, it will be made available 
like others who couldn't join today can catch up on all the amazing presentations we've had. All right, so take a closing prayer and then we can all go after filling the evaluation form. Please don't forget to fill the form. The link has been shared already. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we are very grateful to you for this evening. Thank you for all the knowledge you have imparted on us. We pray that you strengthen our memories, that you help us to be able to use every information we've received today in our practice. Help us to go and be great um, at managing children with COVID-19. Give us the strength to be able to face this pandemic and conquer it through your strength. We thank you for the answered prayer. We ask that you bring us again tomorrow, God willing, to be able to have even more fruitful discussions. Thank you for the answered prayer to Christ our Lord. Amen. A very good evening to everybody. Bye-bye.